Konnichiwa. <laughs> so today I will present you a section of the results that I obtained in my PhD at University of Montreal. Um, so as you all know, uh, the negative energy balance leads to lower immune defenses and of course that will increase the risk of intramammary infections for example and other infections. So here you have a table from a review done by Raboisson and colleagues in 2014 that just uh, resumes a bit the literature on the association between hypercutinemia and uh, risk of mastitis, both so, uh, clinical and subclinical. And uh, so you can see that um, in general uh, there is uh, an association, um, there, there is much higher risk of uh, mastitis in animals that suffered hypercutinemia at the beginning of the lactation. And as you also know, the negative energy balance is the result of high energy demands for milk production and low um, energy supply. And uh, generally, the way that uh, uh, the classic way of limiting this negative energy balance is through increasing the food energy density. Another possibility is to try to temporarily decrease the energy demands through uh, milk production. And so, for example, by doing an incomplete milking, and by incomplete milking, I mean, instead of withdrawing all the milk from cows during the first five days in milk, we would withdraw only 10 liters per day, 10 to 14 liters per day during the first five days in milk without changing milk frequency. And uh, Morin and uh, colleagues have tried this strategy of this protocol for five days in milk. Um, and so you have the incompletely milked cows is the red line, and the blue line is conventionally milked cows, as done normally by farm, on farm. And you have the blood concentration of uh, BHBA on the left, by days in milk. And so what we see is that incompletely milked cows had clearly lower uh, BHBA concentration from four to seven days in milk. And uh, that we could also see after, even after the treatment, there was still lower BHBA concentration in the incompletely milk group. And uh, the prevalence of hypercutinemia was also lower and um, within four to seven days in milk. So uh, cows incompletely milked had 5% um, prevalence of hypercutinemia, while the conventionally milk group had 11% of hypercutinemia. And so, our hypothesis was, since hypercutinemia is highly correlated to, uh, is highly associated to, to the risk of mastitis, we thought, well, um, by decreasing, uh, by preventing hypercutinemia through an in incomplete milking, mastitis could prob probably also be prevented or more readily eliminated. So, so our objectives were to measure the effect of an incomplete milking on incidence of new intramammary infections, on uh, intramammary infection elimination rate, and on clinical mastitis risk. So to do that, um, we selected 13 commercial dairy herds uh, that were, we, we selected them by convenience. They were close to the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Montreal, Quebec. There were several conditions for the selection of these herds. They had to be registered in DHI, and they had to, be, to have milking systems that would allow the measurement of milk withdrawal in real time and other conditions. So one month before calving, multiparous cows were randomly allocated into two groups. Uh, conventionally milk group, so they were milked as usual on farm, and a treatment group, so, and the treatment consisted in um, milking cows until a max of 10 liters per day during the first three days in milk, then 12 liters on the fourth, and 14 liters on the fifth day in milk, without changing milk frequency. To see the impact of this treatment on intramammary infections, what we did was quarter milk samples on the week two and three. And then to calculate uh, this elimination rate, intramural infection elimination rate, we only selected cows that were infected 
um, on the second week in milk. And by infection, we're talking only about uh, somatic cell counts, so uh, somatic cell counts higher than uh, 200,000. And uh, we checked from those uh, infected others, which ones eliminated that infection on the third week in milk. And to calculate the new intramammary infection rate, uh, we only select, it was the contrary, we only selected uh, quarters that were free from intramammary infection, again, lower somatic cell count, and uh, from those, which ones developed intramammary infection on the third week in milk. So we obtained these two outcomes, these two binary outcomes that then we used in two logistic mix models um, with the main, prediction, uh, main predictor, uh, the treatment group. And, um, and we, also, we were also interested in knowing if the effect of incomplete milking would vary as a function of parity. To see the impacts of the incomplete milking on clinical mastitis, uh, we ask farmers to record the mastitis cases uh, in their animal health records. And then we, we checked if uh, between groups there was a difference on time until the first clinical mastitis case. For that, we used the survival analysis. We used the Cox proportional hazard model with the herb frailty term. Uh, again, with treatment group as the main predictor. And we were also interested in knowing if the effect of treatment varied by parity. So here are some results, just for you to have an idea of the differences between um, the milk withdrawal between groups. So the red line is the incompletely milk group uh, that was milked until a max of 10 liters per day during the first three days, then 12, then 14. And the blue, the, in blue, in the box plots, you have, uh, in the box plots, you have the conventionally milk cows. This is what they produced. So you can see that um, um, incompletely milk group, um, the level of milk withdrawing in the incompletely milk group was about half of that of the conventionally milk cows. Then we had, um, in total, we had about 2,900 uh, quarters that were double sampled on uh, second and week, um, second week and third week. From those, 153 uh, were at high somatic cell count on the second week in milk. And we were, we were interested in knowing which ones eliminated that infection on third week. And uh, from those 153, 52 um, eliminated that infection. And we saw that if they were from in, the incompletely milk group, they are, they are the higher odds, odds of eliminated, emulate, eliminating that intramammary infection. So the odds of intramammary infection elimination in incompletely milk cows were three times those of conventional milk cows. Regarding the results for new intramammary infection, so again, from the 2,900 quarters, there were 2,700 that were free from mastitis on week two. And from those, 44 developed uh, intramural infection on week three, and there was no difference between groups uh, for that uh, incidence. Um, so the odds of new intramural infection uh, for incompletely milk cows were 0.9 times those of conventionally milk cows. Non-significant. So we are the results for clinical mastitis. This is, um, these are Kaplan-Meier survival curves. And so at day zero, it's calving day. And you see um, all cows are free from clinical mastitis. And then with the time until 90 days in milk, uh, you see the number of cases increasing. And there were no difference between groups. Again, the red is incompletely milked cows and the blue conventionally milked cows. So as a conclusion, uh, the level of milk withdrawal in incompletely milk cows was about half of that of conventionally milk cows on uh, those um, two to five days in milk. Um, we can conclude that the incompletely milk, incomplete milking does not affect the development of new tumor infections nor uh, of clinical mastitis. And uh, incompletely milk cows have higher odds of intramammary infection elimination than conventional milk cows. I would like to thank my supervisor, Simon Dufour, 
uh, co-supervisors, Jocelyn Dubouc and Jean-Philippe Roy, collaborators, uh, uh, Pierre-Alexandre Morin, Pierre Lacasse, and also, of course, the financial support. Thank you. Thank you very much.